All right, we will get going here. Welcome, my name is Caroline Coons. I'm with Wayfront. Thank you for joining our webinar this morning. Before I hand things off to our presenter, I wanna take care of a couple housekeeping items. So first, let's have Pierre, our presenter, say hello. Make sure we, everyone can hear him. Hello, Caroline. Hello, everybody else. All right, and then the other um, housekeeping items I wanna take care of is, first, please note that we will be recording this webinar um, and we'll make that available to you tomorrow. We'll send it out in an email. Um, so you will have that to be able to rewatch. Second is that this is a Q&A as well. So at the end of the presentation and the demo, we will open up for questions. So feel free to use the chat box um, and type in your questions and we will get to all of those um, at the end. So with that, I'm gonna hand things off to Pierre and he can introduce himself. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, my name is Pierre Tasse. I'm the manager for systems engineering with Wavefront by VMware. Uh, I have been with the organization for a couple of years now, um, well versed in the product and certainly uh, happy and eager to explain a little bit about what Wavefront can do and even provide you with a great in-depth demo of it later on in today's webinar. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, first, let's, let's talk about you know, the fundamental changes that's going on today in our world and particularly the tooling around how uh, we create and build our applications. Um, we're going more and more from the monolith to microservices based applications. Um, and we're doing this for many reasons. Uh, the big one is the software dynamism associated with it, the ability to change small parts without affecting the entire package, the ability to release and deploy quicker, um, and really have more independent components that could be interchanged or swapped out with other compatible components uh, as needed. And as we go down this path, uh, it does require different tooling around how we deliver and, and how we enable these applications to work. And this is really where you start hearing about DevOps come into play here. Because no longer do we just take an application, build an engineering, and flip over the wall and expect the operations to run it. Now, as we continue down this journey, we're seeing the developers are also now responsible to be on call. The developers are now also responsible to provide that first level support when it comes to something is going on in production with our application. Um, and what drives to, to making this difficult is the lack of visibility. That is something that both the developers and the monitoring teams can use together to come to that conclusion or, or to come to find the root cause of potential outages or even helping to make their microservices and their applications work better by understanding how those applications are used and even understanding the user experience of them. <clears throat> and within Wavefront, we are a SaaS-based application that we really strive to help solve these problems. And we do this with a platform. Uh, Wavefront itself provides all the APIs we need for both the front end and the back end. It is a massively scalable time series platform with advanced analytics built into the platform itself. You need not be a data scientist to be able to get great value from Wavefront. Um, you don't need to be a developer to get value from it. However, if a developer wants to do things and look at their data different ways, we provide them the platform which enables them to get where they're going, either through our powerful query language or through our robust APIs. And with this platform, we allow you to really get ahead of the game, spot anomalies earlier on, um, see the trends before they're happening, and, and really get that instant understanding of what is going on in your applications as soon as you deploy those applications for anybody within that organization. Uh, Wavefront, we pride ourselves on our user adoption. When we roll out to brand new customers, the ramp up time of how many new people come on board the platform and are delighted by it is typically massive in our industry. Uh, we have some customers that have over 4,000 active weekly users in our platform. Most of them are developers, of course, and obviously we have some monitoring people, but we even go all the way through the various business tiers so they can understand how it works for them as well. And the key differentiators of why we achieve this, really the number one is a big one. It's our advanced analytics that we could do through this query language of ours that we talk about. We call it TS for time series, but what it allows you to do is, is really understand the data differently. 
um, with that query language is how we really provide that intelligent alerting for you as well as how we approach these kinds of problems. Uh, we don't treat alert alerting as a black box. We allow you to define your alerts the way you define your charts. Um, in fact, they are one and the same the way front. We'll demonstrate that later on. And, and speaking of defining your charts, we have a, a great level of out of the box integrations and dashboards for you to get going with, but we absolutely encourage everybody to create their own view of how they want to understand their application. Um, really easy to customize and share what you've customized within your team and even secure what you're doing as you share it so only the right people see what you need uh, to, to show them. And all this together is with massive scale. The scale that we pride ourselves on, and scalability is not just being able to take in data at massive loads, it's being able to process that data and make it available for you immediately while under massive load. It is availability of scale when you need it. With Wavefront, you could send us a massive amount of data in a single push. Maybe you do a big fleet refresh, and you don't need to wait five, 10, in some cases even 15 minutes before the data can be queried because uh, another system needs to build indexes. Behind the scenes, we do things to make sure you get that instant visibility and you never run blind. And at the same time, we strive that every query completes in less than 100 milliseconds. Um, our internal metric ourselves, how we measure ourselves is to get to that level. Um, so we take care of being able to perform those queries, even when you're looking at millions of data points to try to bring in in a single um, query itself. Getting into data into Wavefront is really about where are you and how do you want to do it. Uh, whether you're using our agents to collect data from your systems or off the shelf applications like maybe a Redis or an Nginx, <clears throat> or you want us to help count some events that are appearing inside of a log and you want to send those logs over uh, TCP similar to how you would work with Splunk or by a fluid D or or maybe you've got a file but you've got an elk stack behind the scenes we could work with that as well your your code instrumentation we provided a, a wealth of different agents as well as extensions to many popular different code instrumentation libraries and we are very open in this aspect here um, Wavefront, we're essentially not opinionated on how you want to instrument your code, and we're willing to work with all of them out there, and we have a lot of integrations for all the popular ones, whether it's DropWizard, um, AppMetrics.io, StatsD, uh, we, we plug into all those frameworks existing today. Or uh, we also take your data directly from your various cloud services, uh, GCP, uh, AWS, even some of the, the, the other ones, perhaps even in the space, we could go after your new Relic Cloud space as well to go pull in data from there and do more with it than what you're getting elsewhere. So really getting data into Wavefront, we provide you all the different ways to do that, a lot of ways to control it, um, but more importantly, full visibility on what it looks like for you so you understand what is going on in my environment as the data is coming in. Um, uh, you see there in the middle, we have this tool we call the Wavefront Proxy. It does speak the data format for Wavefront, but we don't stop there. We do speak many other data formats as well. Uh, a lot of people might have a Prometheus setup already existing. We'll work with that. Uh, perhaps uh, other people are just doing StatsD through Graphite and Grafana. We could actually drop right into that stack and take the data in with zero changes on your side. So we're definitely flexible in how we receive data into our platform and support all the popular formats out there in the world. And, and on that notion of supporting all the different ways to do it, here is just a small splattering of the various out-of-the-box integrations we provide. These are all kind of that one click. You don't really need to do much. You just turn it on, copy and paste maybe a, a configuration setting, and we're going to give you dashboards and alerts immediately off all of these and then quite a few more. This is just really to give you a taste of how massively integrated we are with all the different technologies out there and various off-the-shelf applications you might be using. So uh, before we get too much into the product, I'd like to just spend a couple of times discussing what some of our customers say about us. Uh, popular what we hear is how people just, you know, how we're able to help them predict at massive scale. Uh, Box certainly runs at a very large scale. Uh, you may be familiar with their service. They are definitely the leader in enterprise class cloud storage. Uh, they do all their monitoring with Wavefront. And they're very happy with what they get out of that. 
um, even if you look over at Space It Games, how we could accurately help them understand problems before their customers see it. That's important to them, especially when you're in the mobile gaming space. You need to get really ahead of the problems because if it comes out in the customers, it could really affect you across the board. <clears throat> we even work with um, uh, utility providers or even the fashion industry or the retail industry, helping work with other people there to ensure that they're able to get a very good sense of how their application is working within their world. Uh, fashion ID makes heavy use of microservices, and we help them get insights and visibility into all of them for them. Um, now, with all that being said, I'd like to spend a few moments, and we're going to go over a demo of Wayfront. Um, if you do have any questions, certainly throw them out in the Q&A panel. And, and as we go along, um, as we see them, I'll go ahead and answer them for you. We'll also have a time towards the end, um, should you have any more questions that you would like to get answered. Okay. <clears throat> so starting off here, I'd like to show a little bit about the integrations within Wavefront. Um, really, when you go to get data in, the first thing you need to do is, is or first thing you need to do to Wavefront, Wavefront is to get data into it. Um, we do provide a lot of way for your popular things out of the box across the top. What we say is popular is maybe you're doing Kubernetes or maybe you're within AWS or GCP. Um, if you're on AWS, it's pretty easy to get data flowing in. You would click on it. We give you a quick overview of what it is. You can see here all these various icons. These are some of the out-of-the-box dashboards we provide you with for every one of the services listed. To get set up, uh, we already have an integrate, or we, um, uh, if you want to add an integration, we already have one right here. It'll show up, tell you what it's going on. But to create another integration, you just go ahead and click on this green button right here to so set up. We give you the seven simple steps that you need to create an integration. Uh, this is our account ID. We generate a unique uh, ID for every single customer. Uh, right here for the, for the external ID, you take this, you plug it in inside of AWS. You will generate an IAM role for it. Uh, you return us at the resource uh, locator, the ARN, for that uh, role. You paste it right here. If you would like us to also take in your cloud trail and convert those into events in Wavefront, such as when you're deploying new instances or maybe you're doing a tag changes to your instances and, and cloud trail, those get logged. You can bring those in as events in Wavefront. Give us the details of your cloud trail buckets. You hit set up and you're done. And then we're gonna go ahead and go get all the data for that account in AWS and bring it into Wavefront and give you the dashboards that you've seen on that prior screen. So we already have the data flowing in. I can go ahead and click on any of these ones if I want to, just to understand a little bit more. Uh, maybe I want to go look at our EC2 dashboard here, and we're going to get a view of, of how we're leveraging the EC2 instances. Um, unfortunately, we're not flowing data all the time in this world. <clears throat> um, I got lucky here. I got a couple at least that are working for me. But you can see here it pops up, and it gives you everything you need to do to get kind of that high-level view of AWS off the bat a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes in our world here, but all these dashboards are available for you regardless of the AWS service you're using. Let's take a peek at what Wavefront is. I'm gonna to go to another dashboard here, which is probably more typical of what our customers would create. Uh, they look at things as a full stack view, right? You, you don't necessarily look at one thing at a time. You're not gonna just look at Nginx. You're gonna look at how Nginx works within your stack. Um, in this case here, we're looking at a stack, an application, broken down from the app tier, the data tier. We have a caching layer as well. Then we get into some of the infrastructure stuff, such as the compute, memory, storage, and network, to really get a sense of how our entire stack from the infrastructure through the OS all the way up to the end of the application, how it's all working together and performing on a single dashboard. As I scroll down and I pause here, we take our charts and we load them all on demand. And this is something I really want to point out and stress within Wavefront. Uh, your experience is what matters. If we try to load up all the charts at once, especially if you have a, lot, a busy dashboard, you're going to get a poor experience. And if you get a poor experience, you get poor adoption, you don't really use the tool to help understand what it is that you need to learn. <clears throat> so we only load charts on demand that you bring into view, and these are the only things that refresh. We really keep that experience snappy, and your computer's not gonna be burdened to try to render your monitoring dashboard so you can do other things with it. 
you can also see here we support all the different types of visualizations, being lines or single uh, stats, uh, stack charts, so on and so forth. Now, our dashboards themselves are broken out into sections. My first three rows belong to that overall section. And I can go ahead and click on its name to collapse it. And I get to any of these sections quickly. Just click on their short link up there. Just below that, I've got a couple of drop downs. In this case, we're going to be able to drive filter out with these drop downs. So I can say, hey, go from dev and look at production instead. And when I do that, I now flipped over to looking at all my production data. <clears throat> Now, in this case here, maybe I want to look at my caches section. Maybe that's of interest to me. When I go to the caches section, we see all my charts here refresh. And, and you know, just kind of spotting it out, but this green line here dips really low and flows back in with the rest of the field. Maybe I want to understand what happened here. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on that one. I'm just going to click and drag across the zoom. I'm going to push this same time. That's going to push that same time zoom to all the other charts in my dashboard. So now they're all staring at the exact same slice of time. Now, when I click, when I hover a line, we kind of keep that the focus and we dim out the rest. If you click on a line, we do that exact same effect to all the other charts in your dashboard. And you get additional lines of the selection. Just hold down Command or Control and highlight them and add them in as you see fit. And which machines I selected will show up down here at the bottom. Maybe in this case here, I didn't want this hand colored line so you just go ahead and click on that and it goes away and, and you know let's put that green line back in this is the view I'm looking for this I found something it's of interest to me and I want to work with my team to help understand it but we don't always sit next to our team sometimes we're not even in the same building sometimes we're not even in the same time zone and we need to work and collaborate together we have great tooling to help us do that, be it collaboration tools such as Slack or HipChat or, or maybe you're using Microsoft Teams or, or Skype or whatever communication there is out there. Within Wavefront, every single one of our dashboard and chart screens, we have a link icon in the bottom right-hand corner. If you click on that, we're going to generate a short URL for you. And that short URL does not return a static image. Instead, I get a fully functioning dashboard pre-zoomed in that same slice of time, and those exact same systems that I selected beforehand are selected again for me. So we're working right where I was. And in Wavefront, we actually don't roll up your data. When you send us data at 10 second resolution, or at 30 second resolution, or whatever it is, for the next 18 months, we're gonna keep that original resolution data. And because these links don't expire, I could come back to the same URL in six months from now or one year from now, and I'll get this exact same view. We've got a big retail event coming up here. It's a yearly seasonal thing, Black Friday. And all the retailers are all bracing down and they're getting ready. And inevitably, there's going to be some form of outage or degradation of service somewhere. And they're going to work tirelessly to solve it and get ahead of it and work with it. And people who are using Wavefront in this space, they'll be able to short link those dashboards and store those away later on. Because later on, they're gonna work and build their systems to help get ahead of those degradations of performance, to make their systems even more robust. So next year, it goes even smoother. But they're not gonna be able to solve those problems immediately. And they might not even solve them for the next couple of weeks. But since Wavefront, we don't, uh, we don't roll up that data, we keep its original resolution, and we keep those short links around forever, six months from now when they finally get around to doing a big deployment to get ahead of all that re-engineering re-architecting your systems they could go back to those urls as a way to a, a reference of record did we really fix what we were supposed to be fixing are we addressing all the things that really happened that day continuing on why do we monitor right we talked a little bit about the the general usage and ui of wavefront but now let's get into use cases of using Wavefront. How is it different? What does it do to make my lives better? And the first one, the most important one, is what do you do when something happens? And we talk about the first pane of glass at Wavefront. We get data from all your systems, from all your platforms, and we provide a great way for you to understand it. A lot of people talk about that single pane of glass, but Wavefront, we want to say we're the first pane. We're the paramedics on scene at the scene of an accident. We're the first thing you go use when you need to dig in to understand why something is happening. And we absolutely help you understand why 
something is happening. In this case here, we received an alert. Uh, we have an alert set up. It is a dynamic alert set on the rate of change for transactions per second. And it is a dynamic alert because we expect this thing to go up and down throughout the day. In fact, during the, during the course of the late night, this dips below about 3,000. But what we do is we say dynamically, if my value is greater than 10% below my value from 10 minutes ago, please throw an alert that's a sharp drop and there is a problem. And we can see here, that's what's going on on my transactions per second chart, my red box and my alert firing off into the future. Now, with each one of the data points that we send for transactions per second, this is actually an aggregate of view across of all our customers, all our systems. We can actually look by those dimensions or those point tags, we call them in our world. So I could say, hey, what does this look like by customer? And when I slice this by customer, I have an outage across all of them. So now we've got a real problem. This is a money maker for us. It's key. And we don't know why, we're just dropping transactions. Um, and maybe another way I want to look at this is by actual app tier that's doing this. What, what app servers are responsible for this? And I got lucky. And this happens. We found a bad actor. Well, this is easy enough. We could remediate right away. We could take that machine offline, uh, deploy a new node, uh, deploy additional capacity, take care of the load, uh, whatever it is. And when I hover over this one here, my legend says this one is called App 5. Truth be told, my alert details also told me this is App 5, which is causing our degradation and our downturn in transactions per second. Um, and we could go ahead and, and, like I said, take it offline and kind of get a, a ahead of the problem, but we haven't actually fixed anything yet. We don't know if this is going to happen again. It's going to be all hands on deck and everybody start watching everything until we find out why did App 5 fail? We know what failed. It was App 5, but we don't know why at this point. And I'm going to go ahead and select App 5 from my drop down here. And that drives a filter on this chart. I call this world's ugliest chart. It contains every single piece of data we have for App 5, including transactions per second. <clears throat> now, earlier on, I talked about uh, Wavefront's greatest power, which is our query language. It really allows us to look at our data differently, to apply smarter questions to the data. Um, like all other monitoring platforms, we all have a query language, and we all have a basic set of functions and analytics we support. Some min, max, uh, some filtering stuff, maybe some, some high pass and low pass type of things, or top 10. Everybody supports those. Moving averages, they're all there. But Wavefront, we really wanted to take this to the next level because we know you don't just limit yourself to those simple questions. You might say things like, show me my anomalies based on a forecast model. I don't know how you detect anomalies. I don't know how you do the forecast model, but please just give me that. Um, or maybe I do know how to do them and I want to give you those details and wrap it around my way of doing it. We do that as well. Another one we do is show me a moving correlation of my data. And this one's particularly powerful, very important. What a moving correlation does is given the shape of a line, given the shape of my transactions per seconds metric I'm looking at right here, find me all other metrics that have a similar shape. And notice I'm saying shape here, not values, because these values can be on vastly different scales. A correlation is to look at the shape of something and correlate it to other things that are both same, similar dropping, flat and dropping, or flat and spiking around the same time. Now, we've already put the query behind this chart. All we've got to do is grab it from our drop down here. And when we go ahead and do that, it's going to go through that big mess of data and come back with what really matters. It's going to cut through that noise and tell me what matters in this case here is we have a sudden spike in log errors. But at the same time, our garbage collection also spiked while free memory tagged. So we were looking at a business, a code instrumentation, a business metric transactions per second, and we correlated that against our logging platform, our infrastructure, which is memory, and the JVM, which is our garbage collection. Together, we found out what really happened here. We did a code deploy this morning, and though we've tested that code ad nauseum in QA, we all know production is a different beast. And we probably suspected a code deploy when our outage first happened, but we didn't have hard evidence on it. Now we do. Before Wavefront, this would have been all hands on deck. 
you get the network people, the database engineers, the application engineers, the infrastructure team, the cloud people, everybody all hands on deck. Look at your respective charts and try to understand why this is happening. Other vendors will tell you they do full stack correlation. And what they mean by that is they could take in all the data, you build a dashboard, and you use your eyes as a human being to visually correlate. With Wavefront, we asked a question. And we had the system return us an answer in seconds, which normally would have taken perhaps even man hours to do. And that's really one of the big powers of how we help people get from something to something quickly and answer why. Now the developers could dive into their tool. They could maybe take a look at some stack traces or dig in deeper onto the logs for their application if they had to, to really understand what was going on and why garbage collection has gone amok on that machine or with a new code deploy. Let's move on and talk about making things smarter for you. So there we use Wavefront to help you understand why, but really we also want to make sure we're only asked to do something when it matters, right? When is a sheep crying wolf? Um, alert fatigue is absolutely one of the largest problems in our space. Uh, people miss outages because they have too many alerts firing and they don't know which ones are real, which ones are not. Uh, we hear uh, uh, horror stories of as many as 10,000 alerts a day going off for a, a single data center. That's insane. That's a lot of noise that people need to cut through to understand what's going on. And right here, that's actually what happened. Uh, this is a uh, number of requests going into an edge load balancer. And the way we collect data from this load balancer is via UDP. Well, not very reliable, but definitely works most of the time. Um, unfortunately, um, most of the time means sometimes we lose packets, sometimes we lose data collection, and sometimes we get dips in the data. Now, uh, we try to build an alert to get around those dips, but uh, that alert does still fire. And at 445, 515, and again at 715 in the morning, that alert fired. Somebody got woken up on call. They were not happy because every time that person went to log into the platform and understand what was going on, there was no problem at all. This is three times this happened now that night, being frustrated, a human being, probably not following protocol, knowing full well there's a problem with the way the, the, the data is coming in for that alert um, and, and wanting to get back some sleep and get back ahead of schedule, um, an alert got snoozed. And it would have fired two more times on two more dips. And then at about 1.40 in the afternoon, one customer goes down. Nobody knows about it for about an hour because an alert is snoozed. And then a message comes across and they find out that they're down. And it was a really easy fix for them to get back online. It took them just a few minutes. But they were down for an hour because of alert fatigue. So let's go ahead and construct what their alert was. Right? Um, so we know our data is coming in and down these, these big drops, and we want to get ahead of that. I'm going to go ahead and copy that query. And this here is the Wavefront Query Builder. I'm just going to go ahead and, and kind of build out what was going on. And this is our Query Builder. You can see we have all your different functions right here, uh, very popular things for uh, aggregations and filtering. Uh, we want to smooth out that line. How you smooth out a line is you take a moving average definitely have a moving average. Let's go ahead and select that one and just apply it to our chart. And you can see there clearly I, I've got a line that dips and each time that line dipped, I could see why it would have fired. It kind of makes sense right here. Um, dips, it fires, I log in and we're okay. Maybe it's because uh, I only have a 10 minute moving average. You probably just need to make this a little bit wider and we'll be able to get ahead of these dips. And it's really easy to do and visualize in Wavefront. Just change the 10 to a 30, hit enter, and my line's much smoother in the morning. I've got another dip here later on in the morning that I probably have to trigger on anyway, so it's not so bad. We removed a couple of them at least, or we're cutting that alert fatigue down. But this is not a slope that's representative of the actual outage. And the problem here is we're approaching the problem in a classic, uh, you know, simple way. We're not really asking ourselves what's going on. What we want to do is remove the dips. Because these are the strong spikes are outliers in our data. But we want to catch when something like this happens. What we want to do is not take the average. We want to take the median. We care about when our 50th percentile moves, when the mean of our, or when the median of our data moves, 
not when the mean moves. And that's what a moving average does. If you've got a really big drop or a really big spike, even just a couple data points over 10 is going to skew that average. Wavefront, we absolutely make it super easy to do a moving median of your data. Moving median, it's right here. Same deal, we give you a preview of what happens. Hit this, and when I draw this, I get a gorgeous looking line all morning long with a sharp drop when our event would occur. Now we're getting somewhere. We want to make this an alert. In a way, front, um, I said it earlier, if you can draw it, if you can make a chart out of it, you can make it an alert. All we need to do is say, when does this thing become a condition for us? And conditions can be simple or very complex as well. Let's go ahead and start building that out. So first off, we want to make this into an alert. Um, we want to look at probably a rate of change. This is request rates. Um, and request rate, a good way to look at that is rate of change, which is where am I now versus where was I 10 minutes ago or 15 minutes ago. I mean, we've got a wizard to build that, but uh, for the sake of time here, I'm gonna go ahead and type this up real quickly. I'm gonna give him a name, call him curve for current. I'm gonna divide it by a 10 minute lag onto itself. And when I do this, drawing it on the right-hand axis, I can see I got a red line that bounces around one all morning long with a sharp drop when our event would occur. And uh, I could just look here at the scale, 0.9 or a 10% drop, it's probably a good time for us to say it's a problem. And that's my threshold, that's my condition here for my alert. So it's a dynamic threshold or a dynamic value based on, or, or a value, I'm sorry, based on a dynamic threshold is what we're trying to do. We're looking at the dynamic rate of change. And I'm just gonna say whenever you're less than 0.9. When I do that, my query kind of turns into this negative and positive kind of state of where it's going to happen or it's not going to happen. And to make this an alert, it's as simple as just hitting create alert right from here, and I'm off into our alert builder. Now, the data for this is not live, so we're not going to see anything here. But I want to show you what this looks like. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of that view, and we're going to do another alert query here. Now, behind the scenes, we flow sample data for request latency. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that. Um, it's pretty busy. We have about 40 machines, it's a little bit randomized data. I'm gonna go ahead and just smooth out that data a little bit. <clears throat> a really good way to do that. Maybe I wanna pin that maximum latency because we care about maximum it's a latency. I'm gonna put a 10 minute moving max on this. I'm just gonna go ahead and select 10 minute moving max and that helps clean up that view a little tiny bit. Now, um, in our world, we could say whenever that moving max is greater than, say, uh, 240 milliseconds, let's go ahead and trigger that alert. So I'm going to say 240 for my threshold. And why I wanted to show you this with live data is we actually back test the alert for you. I could see how often this alert will fire in a two hour window or a six hour window. And obviously, at this one here, that's far too noisy. Uh, the person on the other end of that page will absolutely be upset with me. So maybe a I really need to look at a thicker threshold, 260, probably better for me. Um, it would only fire once in the past six hours, and that's probably what I'm looking for. Now, um, when you get this alert, you may want to tell us what is the visualization behind it. This is the condition to my query, but when I receive a link to it, when I get an email about this alert, I don't want to necessarily see the condition. I want to see the data. You tell us what that data is, and it doesn't even have to be the same thing. It could be really whatever matters to you, and we'll give you something that looks like this instead. Um, the, the, the chart that we provide you will have an option for you to look at just a condition, or just this, or both even, at the same time. This here is a, a yellow box that's firing because my severity is set to warn. If I change this to severe, you'll see that same box turns into a red box. <clears throat> and this is important in Wavefront. What happened here is while the alert was firing, while the condition was true, we generated a synthetic event behind the scenes tagged to the machine that that event was firing on. So in this case here, that, uh, that machine is app 10 and I'm firing on network latency. Maybe I am looking at, at a dashboard, I'm a developer and I wrote an application that runs on app 10 and I'm looking at the application metrics on that machine. I'm not looking necessarily at my network metrics, I'm just looking at other metrics. But because my charts contain app 10, as well as, other char as well as other apps, but they contain app 10, 
we're going to automatically overlay this event on your charts. So even if you're not looking at the metric that triggered the alert, we're gonna give you immediate context whenever an alert fires on anything you're trying to look at. Again, it's about Wavefront trying to give you immediate visibility on when something is happening. So you can have action on it right away. Um, who gets notified by an alert? Um, email and page duty are very native to us, but behind the scenes, everything is what we call an alert target. Alert target has three different types of payloads, uh, email, page duty, or a webhook. And a webhook allows us to support things like Victor Ops or Ops Genie or Slack or really any other medium you have. It's ServiceNow or Jira, and we could notify whatever platform you have or even something custom. Um, so that's up to you, and a lot of people take advantage of that. At Wavefront, we take heavy advantage of that to drive our automation. Um, in our world at Wavefront, we believe it's something known as beach ops, which is you can run operations from the beach because your alerts automatically remediate themselves, and we do this via alert targets. Uh, in, in Wavefront, we might auto scale based on multiple metrics, not just CPU or memory usage. Uh, and because of that, we drive that through a Wavefront alert and it makes it happen. Um, last thing I kind of wanted to show you is about performance. Uh, here, we're looking at CPU load taken at one minute intervals over the course of nearly an entire year, if you look at my date stamps right there. Now, I'm gonna take the average function off of this and show you what it looks like. And, and generally speaking, I've got two different machines reporting this CPU load. I've got quite a few more machines right here, but I've generally two different machines or systems that are reporting this metric, taken at one minute intervals. There's over 500,000 minutes in a year, times two, that's well over a million. I'm gonna put this aggregation back on right now, and you see this query came back in about one second. We went through over a million data points, loaded that from disk, and brought it to the front end. Now, I don't have a half a million, million pixels stretching my screen. In fact, right here, it tells me each dot, each bucket, represents about a day's worth of time. So we had to do some form of aggregation to bring that data to my front end. We call that front end aggregation. And in our case, it's defaulted to average. So we had to take 1,440 minutes, average it up into one. I'm gonna flip this over to a max. And when I do that, you're gonna see something really happen to my chart here. No longer are we just at six, seven load average. We actually hit two massive spikes. And I could zoom right in on this spike right here, which actually lasted a whopping seven minutes. Seven minutes is not enough to really change a 1,400 plus minute average, but it's something that happened nonetheless. And you've seen how quickly, literally within seconds, I could drill into that event and see what had happened and transpired. And because Wavefront persists in the details and actually queries those details every time, we never lost the truth. So, knowing all that, that's all I really wanted to share today. Um, if you have any questions, please absolutely post them in the question Q&A panel. Um, I'll, I'll, there's, I don't see any questions in there right now, but um, I'll wait here for a few more moments. Um, certainly would encourage everybody to sign up for a free trial at Wayfront. Really easy to do. Just need an email address and a name, and we'll get you all set up and ready to go, um, as well as some guided tours on how to get data within the platform. Uh, you can do that at wayfront.com forward slash sign up, um, or certainly go check out our blogs. We have a lot of great resources on various uh, topics associated with Wayfront. I don't see any questions in the Q&A panel. Um, with that, I certainly encourage you to reach out to us. If you do have any questions, you could uh, contact us via, via our website, or again, uh, go ahead and sign up for a free trial. Um, thank you very much, and that concludes this webinar.